Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for Veterans and Military Families WebNet webinars. We hope all is well with you and your families. And thank you again for joining us today for our WebNet webinar on tips and advice to keep your business afloat during COVID-19. My name is Elvis Abdich, and I'm Post-Program Support Service Advisor here at IBMF. And IBMF at Syracuse University is higher education's first interdisciplinary academic institute singularly focused on advancing the lives of the nation's military veterans and their families through programs in career, vocations, and entrepreneurship, education, and training. For more information on how you or someone you know can take advantage of IBMF programs and services, please visit us at ibmf.syr.edu. I, along with the rest of the IBMF alumni services team, assist graduates across IBMF programs with researches and networking connections. That's why we have decided to bring you together a couple experts that will share their um, experiences and tips on how to keep your business afloat during this pandemic. Uh, today we have experts and business owners who will share their experience, tips, and professional expertise on keeping your business afloat during COVID-19 as they have themselves probably experienced some of the struggles during this pandemic. Uh, they are going to answer some of the questions such as uh, what avenues of funding they, they seek, uh, what challenge, changes that they made to their business during this pandemic. So our goal of this webinar is to help you start thinking about some of the strategies that you can implement within your own business, how to adapt to the current market and economy, and what avenues to explore to fund your business. But before we get started, I want to let you know that this event is interactive, interactive online experience. So please participate by asking questions. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer as soon as possible. And just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and anybody that had registered will get a link to the recording. Um, as we know, there is no secret as the COVID-19 has disrupted the way many startups and small businesses operate. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, many businesses suffered employment reduction, revenue decrease, and uh, unfortunately, some of them had to foreclose temporarily during this pandemic season. So I'm very delighted to have with us here a few experts to help us um, discuss the topic. So with, with us, we have uh, Ken, Wasselblin, uh, Professor of Entrepreneurial Practice here at Syracuse University's Whitman School of Management. Ken has worked with the large and small businesses. He has a background in entrepreneurship, funding, and entrepreneurial financing. Also with us, we have uh, Catherine Thomas, an Executive Director of Yoga for Change. Catherine founded Yoga for Change in 2014. The organization brings evidence-based programming to veterans, incarcerated individuals, youth, and those with mental health struggles. Currently, the organization employs five individuals full-time and two individuals part-time, and contracts with over 50 yoga teachers across the state. And at least we also have with us uh, our IBMF own alumni of program graduate of Arsenal EBB programs and Veteran Edge, Nick Ripplinger. Nick is a president of Battle Site Technologies, LLC. Um, as you know, Battle Site Technology is a technology company that creates uh, revolutionary products for warfighters, law enforcement agencies, and first responders. Nick is also an author of the number one best-selling uh, book uh, called Frontline Leadership, Applying Military Strategies to Everyday Business. Uh, thank you all guest speakers and welcome. I will now pass the microphone to Ken to introduce um, himself or say anything that I might have missed and anything about himself that he would like to share. Same goes for the rest of you guys. So, Ken, welcome. Thank you, Elvis. Uh, my name is Ken Wall Slavin, and uh, with a name like that, you just go by Ken. So feel free to just call me Ken throughout the course of the, the session, and it'll take some of the heat off of poor Elvis having to pronounce that. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm a professor, but don't look at me as some academic egghead. I've only been a professor for about six years. Um, prior to that, like you folks, I was an entrepreneur. Um, I spent 25 years building a business. Um, like you, I had to go out and, and raise money, develop a product, assess my competition, figure out my marketing, figure out my marketplace, and, and put the, the hammer down. 
So for those 25 years, I was a, an alternative financier specializing in providing financing to small and mid-sized, rapidly growing businesses. Uh, we did that through a financial technique called invoice factoring. And over those years, worked with literally hundreds of entrepreneurs of every different type and stripe, um, some successful, some not so successful. And along the way, kind of learned a few things about how this game gets done. Um, while I'm not physically out in the business world today, I'm here at SU talking about it and, and developing new entrepreneurs. Um, nonetheless, I've been kind of close to the, the news and watching what's been going on with COVID and, and uh, have a particular expertise in turnarounds. So it should kind of dovetail well into this kind of conversation. Catherine? Awesome. Um, thanks, IBMF, for having me. My name is Catherine Thomas. A little easier, I think, Thomas, to pronounce <laughs> the, the other last name, but um, married name. Um, and so I am a, a service stable veteran. I was a helicopter pilot um, in the Navy, and um, due to a pretty serious injury while in deployment, um, I was separated. Um, I'm also a dependent, so my husband is uh, was active duty um, until about 2017, and now he's in the reserves. So I have sort of the both um, in the service and then also being uh, a dependent as well. Um, and on top of that, I, I'm a mom and I have a four-year-old little kid. And so we started Yoga for Change in 2014 um, as a way to give back to our community. And then on top of that, I also am the business development person for an environmental consulting firm um, who works with the Army Corps um, and NOAA as well. So I have a lot of different hats. Um, and I think what we cool about this conversation is I already took, took notes. Um, on invoice factoring. So I'm really excited to <laughs> learn from the other panelists, but also um, to potentially learn and to grow together through whoever is attending live and any comments that we can potentially get after. So thank you so much for having me and I'm really looking forward to uh, the panel and um, off to you. So Elvis and Ashley, again, thanks for having me. I absolutely love the work you guys are doing. So anything we can ever do to support you guys, just let us know. But Battlesites is a technology commercialization firm. So basically we go look for other people's great ideas, acquire their rights to them in some form or fashion, turn it into a product and then sell it to our core customers. So it's kind of us in a nutshell. Thank you all. And uh, just let our audience know, if you guys have any questions for our uh, guest panelists as we go through our discussion, please uh, type in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so let's get started. Um, Ken, as you know, small businesses are among the hardest hit as the coronavirus pandemic continues to cause economic uncertainty in communities across the U.S. So my question to you is, based on your opinion and professional expertise, uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes have you seen small businesses make uh, since the crisis hit? And um, what are some of the smartest moves have you seen small business make during this pandemic to adopt? And like, what are your suggestions and uh, tips for small business owners to stay afloat? That's a lot to unpack, Elvis. Um, let, let's see if we can kind of break it down. Um, I'm oftentimes reminded at times like this of an old expression that says leaders have to lead. And uh, I was thinking about what my comments here for today, uh, a few days ago, I, was, I have to kind of take you on a short little story to draw an analogy here. Um, so I was out riding my bicycle and I was thinking as I was cruising along, what, what would, would, how would I respond to a question such as that? And out in front on the road in front of me jumped a squirrel. And as we've all seen driving along as we, we do, squirrels either do two things, either run quickly across the road because they've got a plan and they, they're there to get to the other side, or they get out in the middle of the road and they have a brain freeze. They stand there and they flip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And inevitably, if, it, if you're driving a car as opposed to a bicycle, you turn that squirrel into a flathead squirrel. So my first order of business is to say, don't be a flathead squirrel, all right? Have a plan. And, and in that sense, what I want you to think about is that you are the leader. You're the visionary leader for your business. Um, you, are, you are hit by all sorts of different, unusual and unexpected things that are happening to us all, or, all around us. You can't have brain freeze. So, so with that as the challenge, you need to be thinking about the fact that right now, today, in this environment, there are people whose businesses and fortunes and careers are being made in a positive way. They're going to be the people that we're going to write about. We're going to write books about in, in coming years, about those that survived and thrived during this period of time. There's also going to be people that we'll write about that will likely be forgotten in, throughout history who didn't 
make it through because they weren't properly prepared. So the part of your, your question about what to think about, what to do, what to consider, I would hearken back to some of the basics. First off, liquidity. Liquidity is the biggest thing. As anybody who runs a business already knows, you can't pay bills with profits. You have to pay it with cash. And sometimes you have to make a choice between having cash flow versus having profits. Design your business model to provide as much liquidity as you possibly can. It's that cash, that liquidity that's going to be able to enable you to dig out of this. But then you've got to get creative as you're going to hear from some of the other guests here this, e this afternoon. Um, start to think about new areas for your business. Um, look at your business critically. Think about who you serve. Think about new people that you can serve. We've seen, we're seeing it every day with restaurants who before would never take out company, you know, restaurants. They always sit down. That they've now had to react to that. Start to look at your customers in a critical fashion and try and figure out what do they want? What can you deliver to them? And perhaps that's different than what you used to do. So have that plan and try and figure that out, but always with an eye towards liquidity, which also means that if you've been doing something that's not profitable, now's the time to change that. All right, try and look into your crystal ball and try and figure out what life's going to look like on the other side of COVID. And maybe that unprofitable line of work isn't really going to come back. If I was in the restaurant business, for example, to think that the world is suddenly going to fill my dining room as soon as, the, as, soon as we have a, a COVID vaccine would be foolhardy. People have changed the way they, are, they interact. They've changed with the, with the way that they consume services. So think about how that's going to change in the future. Um, be honest with your staff. Be honest with, with your, the, the folks who work with you. Be sure that there's a teamwork going on. Um, you know, most of the people on, on, on this uh, webinar are, are either current or ex-military. You know what it's like to be part of a team. You know that the team functions well when there's transparency, when there's a clear understanding of what the mission is. So ensure that everyone on your team has that clarity. And then the final part I'd, I'd answer to your question is, is to surround yourself with advisors. Um, this is not a solo uh, enterprise. You might consider yourself to be a solo practitioner, but you're not, not in this environment. You need to surround yourself with as many people as possible that can give you advice and give you ideas. Ultimately, you are the leader and leaders lead, but surround yourself with opinions, surround yourself with complimentary thought, surround yourself with experts. Those, I guess, would be the, some of the, the ideas. And I, I should also add, to Elvis, thank you for letting me go first, because undoubtedly I stole thunder from some of the other folks that are gonna follow. Um, but, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yield to them now as opposed to steal all of their good ideas, perhaps. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, um, I just want to stay with you because you mentioned the change, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, as you know, the economy keeps going, right? It's not going to stop. And uh, as more business sectors are in industry are keep reopening. Uh, from your professional, you know, expertise, what do you think are some of the key changes small business, you know, need to make to be able to adapt to the new normal, you know? And, you know, I, Another question to that one is just think about entrepreneurial psychology, you know, you, you know, how can a small business owner avoid feeling defeated, you know, because sometimes, you know, as a business owner, you feel like the whole world is conspiring to beat you down, you know, how can you deliver that leadership in you know, these super critical times? Yeah, let me, let me deal with those points, maybe in reverse order. Let me start out with the psychology. Um, let me point out to everyone that there has been no better time to be an entrepreneur. That might cause you to sit up in your chair right now and say, what is he smoking, All right? But understand this, guys. Entrepreneurship flourishes when there's turbulence. There's a shakeout going on right now. It's all around us. We're gonna look back at this through history books and say, wow, that was a big change. Look at how the economy changed. Well, that turbulence breeds opportunity. There's a lot of businesses that are not nimble that are not able to react to this change, that are going to, to flounder. There's other businesses like hopefully yours that, that can react quickly to change, that can pivot fast, that can understand their marketplace, can, can lead often to a different direction and see opportunity. So from a psychological standpoint, let's, let's eliminate this negativity. There has never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. If you're clever, don't be the flathead squirrel. Right? Don't stand there and wonder which way to go. What do I do? What do I do? But rather figure out what your plan is and go execute on it. 
because I'm telling you there's opportunity out there. There are businesses out there that are flourishing right now like never before. How do you like to have been a, a, a delivery service, a food service delivery company prior to this? Wow, you just your business just quadrupled. Or, or look at, at all the different changes that are going on in the economy. There are businesses out there that are flourishing. Make sure yours is one of them. Um, yes, change breeds, breeds uncertainty and breeds fear sometimes, but it also breeds opportunity and, and don't lose sight of that. Now, in terms of the other parts of your question, um, and by the way, you're becoming a master at multiple step parts of the questions here. I'm trying to remember the other parts. But essentially, I would tell you from a strategic standpoint to think about how you're going to reopen. Don't reopen all at once, reopen in stages. Think about how you're going to, to uh, fund the reopening stages. Uh, do you have the cash to do it all on your own or must you rely on third parties? Yeah, sure, you can think about outside financiers and certainly they're out there, but make no mistake, they're a little tighter with their money today than they were before. But there's other ways to kind of fund your business besides just getting money from a third party, maybe getting extensions of trade credit from, from your suppliers. That's just as good as a loan in many cases. Um, so think about different ways operationally to deliver your service that are ways that, that comport better with today's coronavirus environment. Um, you know, it's a new world. Uh, the entrepreneurs that are nimble, that are quick, that are responsive and can lead are the ones that are going to flourish. Thank you, Ken, for such a great insight. Um, Ketan, over to you now. Uh, I know you want to give us a little background about your nonprofit organization and um, give us a little, tell us a little about uh, like what are some of the changes have you faced during COVID-19 and uh, what have you done to overcome those challenges? So uh, Yoga for Change brings programming sort of like a subcontractor to large organizations. We're not a studio. Um, what we've done is we've created curriculum that leverages a very traditional movement modality um, with evidence-based practices that's, that have been researched by Boston University to show um, quantitative and qualitative statistically significant impact on anybody who goes through our programming. So think like we offer classes to um, organizations like Canines for Warriors or Wounded Warriors or Veteran Court or Drug Court or Youth Programming or people with mental health struggles. So as opposed to us having to pay for overhead, um, we have already all been working remotely prior to COVID with in-person programming going in as sort of like a subcontractor to advance or to, to bring an addendum to other programming that serve our four populations, veterans, incarcerated individuals, youth, and people with mental health struggles. Um, so we're in Florida, across the state of Florida. Um, I was able to watch the news and see what other states were doing because um, Florida was a little bit behind on closing all the doors. Um, and to be quite honest, although yoga is really top of mind for me and my entire staff, it's usually not the top 10 priority of a person who's about to close down their rehabilitation center um, or their behavioral health center or their rehab or their um, pain clinic kind of thing, right? So we created and started the virtual transition process prior to how it was mandated because we could see the writing on the wall. Um, so we had to transfer all our programming from totally in person to virtual. Um, doesn't really sound like an issue because now we're in the Zoom land that we're all in right now, but at the very beginning, being ahead of the curve set us up for success. Um, we were in the public school district, we were in charter schools, we were in alternative schools, we were in Department of Juvenile Justice facilities. So how do we get those people to want to keep our programming? With, with our track record, yes, but many of those places just closed down. Um, and then asking the school district to continue offering yoga when they're still trying to figure out their own dashboard and platforms, we did lose clients. Um, we did we did lose clients. So we had 70 classes that we were offering in person weekly prior to COVID and, and right after COVID went down, we went down to 30. So um, talking about being really clear communication with your staff, um, I had to let 50 contractors go um, because as many people know, the PPP loan only refunded or only covered employees full-time and part-time. And there's a lot of, you know, all my people are gig workers really. Um, so I had a very clear communication with them. Um, but I didn't want Yoga for Change to fully have to close. Um, so we really just focused on the full-time employees and the part-time. And I made a commitment to my team 
um, that I would get them all back on salary in one month. And so, or all back on contracts in one month. Um, so my team hustled hard. And what we did during that program is now we looked outside the box, right? We, we um, were able to kind of pivot and offer virtual programming for people now who employees are all working at home. So um, by opening up our mission, because we were really only initially doing subs people with substance abuse as opposed to mental health, we were able to include more people on our mission to help with um, more organizations here locally, but also further. So we actually went out and started to pitch organizations who are outside. So we've been offering classes for Teach for America in Texas. We've been offering classes for nonprofits in Annapolis, Maryland. So we were able to grow our scope. And what we also were able to do was we'd able to really figure out how to evaluate our program virtually. Because one of the things of our unique value proposition is the consistent evaluation. So how can we ensure that the donor or grantor is getting the same impact wanted um, virtually because it's totally different, right? Going through a screen doing yoga is a lot different than being in class and in person. So um, we were able to pivot to a virtual environment and we were able to do it very quickly um, because, and we did not wait to be told we were out. We were waited to be told, we told our clients that we were pulling out, which was a little different, um, but that allowed us to have everything in place. So when they did shift to telemedicine, we were already ready. It wasn't a last thought. And because again, yoga is really not top of mind for a rehabilitation center or, or a jail, if you will. Um, and then we had all of our fundraising events have been canceled. So as a nonprofit, um, we bring money in six different ways. So we had to totally pivot um, how we were fundraising. Um, we are still figuring out that avenue, but at the same time, because we've able to pivot to new expansion and client base, um, all our clients do pay for services in some way, shape or form. So we've been able to kind of keep that together. Um, we are exploring sort of the new fundraising realm in the virtual environment, but um, being able to really pivot quickly and then have clear communication was, was essential for us. Um, and now we have a lot more communication online, which is great um, because like I said, we never had a brick and mortar, so we were never really worried about rent. Um, but now we've been able to sort of have more meetings where our whole team are together virtually as opposed to just on the phone or just not having one. Um, so that's kind of what we did with that. Thank you, Catherine. And yeah. Nick, uh, to you now, you're, you're, you're in the same boat as Catherine, you know, you're a business owner. And can you tell us a little bit about battle site technologies and if you had any struggles during this, you know, pandemic and what strategies have you implemented to adopt the current market? Yeah, so Battlesite, we sell infrared to the military, first responders, emergency management professionals, and it's really hard to put a brochure in front of somebody or digital market to these type of, uh, you know, professionals where our products you kind of see and touch and feel and kind of go into that dark room and vandalize something or go in there and look at a patch. So from that aspect, it got incredibly hard. And, but on the flip side, it also kind of got a lot easier. It probably hurt. It's definitely crushed the sales side of things. Like there's no way to sugarcoat that. But with all of our customers being at home, we've been able to really expand our product lines and reach out to the people that, you know, have used our products to understand what we're doing here. And now that everybody's working from home, they seem to have a lot more free time that we're able to, you know, kind of ideate on some new product developments. Um, one of the big challenges we faced here in Ohio was the initial shut everything down. So we ended up putting the majority of the staff on a paid furlough for eight or nine weeks. And during that time and of uncertainty kind of tie into what Ken was mentioned, we were fortunate enough, we were in a position and had the cash on hand that we went out and bought massive quantities like 50,000 pounds of hand sanitizer so we shut over our production line and bottled all this bulk hand sanitizer down and just shipped them out to our customers and then that kind of spun out into its own little side business for uh, about a month and a half or so that we were supplying the whole kind of region with hand sanitizer interesting Thank you, Nick. I'll, I'll stop here just for a second, just to address our audience uh, watching today webinar. Guys, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Also, we do appreciate any comments, any challenges that you're dealing with your own business that you'd like us to address, let us know. Um, and uh, well, I guess we'll move on. So I'm gonna, next question is goes for Ken, as we talk about the strategies and uh, I wanna, you know, to ask you 
what are your some your like uh, suggestions in regards to businesses implementing strategies during this pandemic? Um, I would imagine right now the most important things for small businesses is trying to secure funding for business to keep to keep the expenses right because they're not either either they're just reopening or they have been you know decreased in the volume of customers. So do you have you know, do you want to tell us a little bit more importance about securing funding during this crisis and your advice to best approach as a small business to obtain funding? Sorry about that. I was rattling on while the mic was muted. Uh, first off, let me point out if, if it wasn't, you know, already noted by everyone that, that our other two guests, Catherine and Nick, have both taken advantage of market conditions and pivoted. They've changed what they did, um, and they they found new opportunity. Um, you know, when you think about Catherine providing her services to a new marketplace, or or Nick looking out and and trying to figure out uh, what you can do with fifty thousand pounds of hand sanitizer. Uh, the point is that they both looked at life through a different lens. They first looked at what do their customers need, as opposed to what do you sell. The question was, what does my customer really need? And in each of those two examples, they changed their business approach to accommodate that question. And so that, that's where we want to start. Now, getting to your issue of, of finance, um, let's understand, as I said earlier, the distinction when I say run your business for liquidity versus earnings. Let me, let me dig into that a little bit, right? So I'm less concerned today with funding the business if I was running my business. So I'd be less concerned about funding it with outside capital and more thinking about how I'm going to do it with general, internally generated cash flow. Um, and by the way, that's, that should always be the approach. But, but it really is underscored nowadays. So how do you improve your, in, your internal cash flow? Well, you're, you're going to have to improve your receipts, your collection of, of proceeds. You might have to consider improving the margins you have on transactions, maybe you raise your prices a little bit. I know that sounds sacrilegious, but it's legitimate. Um, maybe you find ways to reduce your costs or to delay the payment of costs. Now, I could talk to you, you know, about all the usual platitudes, you know, keep your personal credit squeaky clean and it's more important now than it ever is. And by the way, that's true. But what I'm really thinking is you've got to first lean out the, op, the, the business. You've got to be sure you you fill all of those different profit leaks in your business. Um, consider every bill that you pay. Is this really necessary? Is this really critical? Um, can I get, get by without this, this additional product or this additional cost? Once you've figured that out, I then want to, you to consider going to your supply chain. That is to say the people who supply you with goods and services. And I want you to figure out how to get more of their goods and services from them without having to pay them right away. Um, if you're presently paying things on a COD basis, a get out of the COD world. You're now paying on things on 30 day terms. If someone's providing you 30 day terms, find a way to get 60 day terms from them. By the way, these days, they're likely going to say, okay, especially if you've been a good customer along the way. What happens to your cash flow when you uh, turn 30 day payments into 60 days? It improves it. It reduces the amount of excess capital you need and improves your cash flow, which is what I said at the outset of our conversation you really need to focus in on. It's that cash flow that's going to enable you to have cash, to be able to enable you to, to survive. Um, so remember that supply chain credit extensions as well, not just the terms of payment, but also some, somebody who might previously have said you can have up to $10,000 worth of goods or services from them before they, they would get, get concerned about cutting back, turn that into 25,000 or 50,000. Find a way to get that up there because in doing so, you're improving that cash flow. You haven't hurt your profitability here one bit, but you're improving the cash flow. So it, it keeps coming back to that. Think about your landlord. Um, you know, their landlords are certainly not in the leverage business these days. They don't have much leverage. Who's, who's going to come in and, and rent your place out? So you might be talking to your landlord about delaying payments or even reducing the amount that you, you're, you're, you're getting involved with. Maybe you can go to the bank and, and look at a loan deferment on your existing term, or maybe just change the repayment structure a little bit. The point is that before you pass the hat to third parties, you need to look internally 
and you need to find all these alternative ways to improve your cash flow so that maybe you don't need third party financing, or if you do need it, you need less of it. Now, if you start thinking about the third party financing, you can go to a bank potentially, and that, that might be perfectly fine, but understand that they are, they are collateral lenders, which is to say they're going to require collateral from you to support that loan. Maybe you've already been to the bank once, they already have now all the collateral. You might not have additional collateral to work with. You might not get a happy answer at the bank these days. Um, maybe there are, are alternative financiers, like I was, um, that can provide you fi financing, either short term so that you can build out on a project or potentially longer term core capitalization based on non-collateralized assets. So there's lots of different things to consider, but again, you have to maybe get creative. The old way of just doing it, running down to the bank might not be the way to do it any longer. So you need to figure out a way to get by with, without that third party financing or at the alternative, reduce your need for it. Thank you, Ken. Um, Catherine, back to you. Um, what tips do you have to share with, with our entrepreneur, entrepreneurs here regarding the access to funding? Because uh, you are a nonprofit organization and uh, what ways have you fundraised for your organization? Like, especially during this pandemic, but also other avenues that you took that you can share with us. Uh, so what's been really cool is when the CARES Act came out, um, I was on every webinar and every workshop on how to potentially secure funding through the CARES Act. And Yoga for Change is great. We do have a nonprofit, but we do not, we do not do um, traditional, month, traditional health, education, or shelters. So a lot of those money was rightly diverted specifically to those sectors of the nonprofit um, besides for the PPP loan and we did not apply for that emergency um, funding from the SBA so we were we were able to secure the PPP loan but it but we also um, didn't start tightening um, yes we had to let you know yes we had to let 50 contractors go but we are a community organization so we actually increased our collaborations and tried to figure out ways that we could bring back community other local businesses so um, one thing that we have done is we've kind of worked with uh, local businesses, restaurants specifically called it Dine for Change. So we bring, we promote that business and they either give a percentage of sales or a sale of this item to us. Um, and that allows us to spread our message to new people in our community, but also to give uh, local businesses some new clients. So um, for May 5th was Cinco de Mayo. It also fell on a Tuesday. So it was Taco Tuesdays on Cinco de Mayo. Um, we, our, our restaurants in the area had just been able to now serve to go food. So um, they had no idea what kind of customer base they were gonna have. Um, and we actually, they had an expectation um, and we increased that sales by 200% for that local business um, that was serving burritos, right? So by just by small collaborations, as opposed to trying to figure out like what is only going to serve me and, and give me um, potential revenue. On top of that, how could you potentially collaborate with another business to increase your own client base? Um, obviously not a competitor, right? But you want to increase your own client base in a unique way to help you grow. Um, and then we also practiced failing a lot. Um, we weren't doing potential uh, like Hail Mary pass failing where the end of the world was upon us if we didn't succeed. Um, but what we were able to do was to, to fail at fundraising in smaller areas to help us grow and then allow us to have practice um, when we're actually pitching a new virtual idea. So um, I would suggest that if you have had a chance to make it this far through this current unprecedented time to take notes, um, to see where you failed, and that will help you make sure you're not repeating the same mistakes because um, I, we're not going in person anytime soon personally here in Florida. And so we have to figure out how to can sustain this momentum we've created, but how can we also grow in the process? Because um, I had a great quote, you know, if the grass is not growing, it's dead. Um, so how can we as a business continue to grow, but also in a really intentional way, not mission creeping for a nonprofit. We want to make sure we're very clear with what we're doing. Um, but how can we also bring people to the table as well? So we have a little bit different model, um, but really collaborate and practice failing is what I would say has really helped us. Thank you, Catherine. It looks like we have a question from one of the audience. Uh, Patrick asks, I'm starting conversation with someone ready to retire. 
on acquiring their business? Is this a bad time to take on risk of acquisition? Is funding available for acquisition? Can so, Catherine, Nick, any suggestions? Go ahead, Nick. Were you going to respond? Yeah, just from you know our perspective, we kind of, I feel like there's a couple different ways you can handle this current time. We chose to spend our way through it because, you know, luckily we were in a position that we could afford that. But I don't think, I think now's a great time to make acquisitions and kind of make those moves and, you know, grow what you already have. Just from my side of view, I'll let Ken talk more on the financing side of things, but I don't think there's ever a bad time to grow. Yeah, I would echo next point, Brian. Um, your question really had two parts to it. One was, you know, is this a good time? Uh, and two is, can I, where can I get financing? Um, I might suggest to you that you don't need financing. Now that might sound kind of curious because I know nothing about your circumstance, but I do know that sellers these days don't have a long line of people in front of them for all the obvious reasons. And the seller might hold paper. Indeed, they likely would. So what does that mean? That means that if I want to sell my business to you for half a million bucks, you say, here's a small pittance of a down payment. Um, I'll pay you your price because I like the business. I think it's a good business, but you need to hold paper. I'm going to make payments to you. And I'm going to make payments to you over the course of the next three or four years. Well, guess what? You just found a lender. It's called the seller, right? So now your payments are coming in. You don't have to come out of pocket. You don't have to go to a third party to come up with cash. and and in truth, it's not a bad deal for the seller. You might wonder, why would the seller want to do this? Well, let's think this through, Brian. If the seller uh, is receiving payments and you're halfway through the payments and then all of a sudden you stop, the seller gets to take the business back. They get to sell it again. There's nothing more beautiful as a seller than getting to sell the same asset more than once. Um, and they get to keep all of the cash that you paid them along the way. So. You know, what you essentially do is you say to them, look, I need you to hold paper. Um, you can take a collateral interest in the stock of the business. If I default, you can have the business back. That's a pretty persuasive argument to a seller to take, take a chance on you, Brian. Um, and because there's really not much of a line of, of potential buyers at their door, you might be able to acquire this business without having to pay for it up front. Absolutely love that model. And I've seen it done successfully multiple times. So great advice, Ken. And I just want to add as well something quickly. Um, it also keeps the seller engaged. And so they want you to be successful because if you're paying potentially from proceeds or from revenue, they still want their business to be successful. And that will also help with introductions and networking as well, because you're not just bringing your own network, you're tapped into their potential already existing client network. Um, and it shows a more warm transition as opposed to this is the new owner. This was the old owner. It's kind of you're owning it together as you move forward in the new, the new time as well. Yeah. Great. But, you know, it goes back a little bit to opportunity and innovation. And I'll just, you know, finish the, the thought out by saying, as, as I said earlier, this is a great time to buy a business if you have a plan, because there's everybody else is scrambling. They're, they're going to turn into flathead squirrels. And you're going to, I keep coming back to that, by the way, Elvis, Elvis maybe we can retitle this, this presentation. <laughs> Flat, don't be a flathead squirrel. Um, but the, the reality is that, um, uh, if, if, you, if you have a plan, now's a great time to do it and, and you can execute on it. And trust me, the days only get better down the road when coronavirus starts to go away. Exactly. Great. Thank you guys for great suggestions. Uh, Nick, I want to get back to you and, uh, you know, just to talk about the funding as well. Uh, I know you did a lot of funding for your business and what can you share with us from your experience with fundraising? I know you did a angel investors, business plan competitions and all the different things. Yeah. You know, I think there's so much money out there in the world right now. <clears throat> well, at least before the pandemic, I don't really know what it's like as of today, but there's always some sort of business plan competition or some sort of, you know, mentoring program you can get into with financing at the end. But the kind of the best thing that's worked for us, and we have, you know, no outside investors or any debt on the books right now, which is, you know, a great thing to say. So I'd be super careful what type of fundraising you guys are interested in doing. But, uh, you know, lean on your customers. You know, at least in our situation, our customers have some disposable income. and They're not afraid to 
invest in new products and new ideas that make their lives easier. So kind of, I think, you know, everything that Catherine said and Ken said that we've kind of been talking about today is just be creative and don't think inside of that box and look at every different possibility. There's always a way and, you know, there's, we've never had a problem finding what we needed to, you know, continue to grow and succeed. Nick, did you guys um, had any fundraising during this pandemic or no? Uh, we won some R&D contracts with existing customers. Um, so some growth on that front as well. And then really kind of taking an inventory of, you know, what are our core capabilities here and how can we expand what we're already doing, you know, to serve our existing customers? Because I'm a firm believer it's a lot easier to get, you know, that second dollar from an existing customer and then go find that first dollar from a new customer. Awesome. Great. So if guys, anybody watching out there, if you guys have any questions or challenges or comments that you would like to make, uh, please let us know uh, via chat box. Otherwise, um, we'll just continue and we only have 20 minutes left. So I just want to get some final thoughts. Ken, um, do you have any last tips, advice for our veteran business owners from your perspective? What challenges should small business owners expect? you know, and your suggestions for best prepared for these challenges. Yeah. Don't be scared. Um, you know, let's be honest, being a, an entrepreneur, being a small business owner, there's plenty of things to worry about. Don't, don't add the current coronavirus to it unnecessarily. Look at the coronavirus, not as a problem, but as an opportunity, the world has changed. Be on the front end of that change, capture the opportunity that that presents. It's going to change in the way that you interact with your customers, how they interact with you. By example, you want to be really active online. You want to have a great, robust website and be active on social media because that's where the customers are today. Um, you know, don't go open a storefront with, for brick and mortar right now because I don't think a whole lot of people are shopping there. Uh, so in many regards, think about how the world has changed. Think about the fact that there's a new dynamic to how business is done. And, it, and address that, react to that, Dr drive a path, figure out a strategy that's going to work for your particular business. Always be consumed with the question of what does my customer want? What value can I deliver to them? Whether your customer is a company or an individual, it doesn't matter. What does my customer need? If that is your guiding light, you're going to come up with the right answer. You're going to come up with the right strategy and you're going to be able to be a leader and you're going to be one of the people that they write the books about when they talk about who survived in coronavirus and who didn't. Um, so you want that, that to happen. Now, we have fancy terms like that called innovation and, and, and whatnot, but it's, it's not so much innovation as it's just flexibility. It's pivoting. It's, it's being decisive. It's understanding the need and doing something about it and going forward with it. And, and from our other two guests today, you've heard great things about how they did those exact things. Um, you know, I think it was Catherine who used the term uh, in being intentional. Uh, be intentional with what you do. Be, be purposeful. Um, don't let fate come up and smack you in the back of the head. Control your environment. Control your company's action. And, and remember that leaders lead. Your company and your employees need you to do it. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Catherine? Do you have anything else that you wish to share with our audience? Any last tips, advice? Yeah, I, um, I really think we have the opportunity now in a small way to potentially practice, practice failing um, little, little things. If you have that ability that way, when you are, when you are launching a new product or you are trying to get secure a deal, you've already, you've already figured out how you can fail and how you can learn from all your failures. Um, and then uh, collaborate. I think right now a lot of people are tightening their, like they're squeezing their fists to try to make their business work. Um, but I know when I go to the beach and I squeeze my fists to hold all that sand in, um, the sand keeps falling out. So if you can open up your hand, you can actually, you can actually hold more sand. I know that's sort of a weird analogy, but as a business owner, we have the opportunity right now to either tighten and to constrain um, in this environment, which, which might feel good for this, you know, this right now, but is there a way that you can actually grow your business by collaborations? Um, and in that way, um, always give people the benefit of the doubt, right? You may be calling somebody and it may literally be the, their worst day in their whole life. And so that one interaction may not go exactly as you had planned, but give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, especially right now in this time, there is so much going on in everyone's life. Um, you may not be 
their first choice or top of mind. But if you continue to give people the benefit of the doubt, um, they will come in and come back to you. Um, we've had that experience with Yoga for Change um, and my other business, Animar Environmental Consulting. And so if we can just potentially learn how to collaborate outside of our little, our normal ways, I think we all can grow and, and, and make it through um, and be better on, at the other end. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Nick, what about you? Do you have any uh, last comments, advice, tips to share with our audience before we get to Patrick's question? Yeah, the first is uh, I'm going to go down and visit Catherine and see some of the sand and the beaches that she was just talking about. <laughs> but I think there, there's two big takeaways I really learned during all this is one is you got to keep your foot on the gas and keep moving forward and keep violently executing every day towards whatever the end state goal is for you. And then the other one is you just got to be transparent. And I think Ken hit on this really well in the beginning, but communicate with your customers and leverage, you know, what they're looking for in this time as well. And then communicate with your team because at the end of the day, they're the ones that's keeping you afloat and keep, keep in communication with your supply chain and let them know what's going on. So you guys can adjust, they can adjust and everybody can come out on top. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, for all of your questions, we have Patrick. Uh, he asked, what decision-making tools do you have or suggest? I, I would respond to Patrick um, by going back to, to basics. Uh, we call it feasibility analysis. Um, so if you've got, if you've got a, uh, a prospective business to enter into or a new division or a new marketplace, um, you've, you've got, don't, don't just wing it. You've got, you've got tools and those tools really haven't changed. They're the same tools you had pre coronavirus, which is you want to measure your market. You want to understand your, your customer demographic and understand their motivations and figure out how best to, to move forward to, um, uh, to be able to enter into that market successfully, to look at the competition, to ensure that you've planned for success. And, and, and what I mean by that, let me un underscore that. Um, you know, what, what is success going to mean to your financial situation? Um, few of us appreciate it until we've had success, but success requires capital. Um, and we'll, as we grow our business, we need access to more capital. Have we thought that through? Um, so at the end of the day, from a decision-making process standpoint, I don't, I don't ascribe to, you know, the latest and greatest pot management. Here's a decision-making tool kind of thing. I go back to the old steady eddy stuff. I go back to to feasibility analysis and then looking at a marketplace, looking at my product, looking at my competition, trying to gauge and survey prospective customers, trying to understand the marketplace and do what I can before I move, move forward. If, if everything looks positive, don't let coronavirus hold you back. Get out there and do it. I, um, for us, for Yoga for Change, um, we're very mission specific, right? Because we're not gonna create a new service or product just because there's grant money out here, right? So we have to be very intentional with where we're going in the direction. And so um, I, would, I would say, what decision-making tools do we have? Well, well, you need to have a plan. Like you have to have, you have to have a plan. Like what is your strategy over the next five years? And something may come up, which like Corona virus, right? Might, might occur, which, which totally derails your whole strategy. But how can you stay true to where you want to be in five years? And does this new opportunity take you there or does it divert you? And is the diversion actually beneficial to the way that you want your company to look or organization to grow in the next couple of years? Or is there going to be a lot of funding that needs to be created? Um, Cause like Ken said, it takes money to make money. Um, it takes a lot of money to fundraise, right? Like it takes a lot of money to send out mailers or to do those client calls or a lot of at least employee hours. So how much money can you actually set aside to create that project? Cause although it might be a really great idea, um, don't shift your business just because it's a good idea, right? Because that funding source may actually disappear in a year from now. And now you've created and done all this sunk cost to create something new. Um, and I just want to elevate what Nick said, where gut, if you know that it's the wrong way to go, don't go against what you intrinsically know to be true. Make sure that you're seriously considering like what was your gut reaction? Because normally your gut reaction is usually true. So just to kind of piggyback off what Catherine said again, is like you have to have that plan in order to be able to make those gut decisions. So you got to know where you're going. So I think she kind of hit that, whatever, what I was thinking right on the head. 
Thank you all. And as we conclude this session, I have one question for all of you is, uh, as you know, we, we have some recent veterans who are looking to start businesses and become entrepreneurs. We have a couple of them graduated this year during this pandemic. Uh, what advice would you guys give uh, businesses who are starting out right now? This is gonna sound really pedestrian, but it's it's uh, has always been the case pre-COVID and post-COVID. Know thy customer, understand what they want, what they need, and give it to them. Understand that you need to add value. It's not what you sell. It's not the cool technology that you have. None of that matters if you're not adding value to the customer's need. If the cus if you understand the customer, you understand their need and you understand how to deliver value to improve their world, you have a chance of success. Without that, there's no starting point. I'm really jealous I didn't get to go first because that was really <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Yeah. Uh, I had to pay a lot of, I had to pay a lot of money. Uh, I had to pay a lot of money here. I like it. Um, my one advice is don't give up, right? You're gonna have, there's gonna be days that are gonna be the best days of your whole life and it's gonna be because you founded this business. And then there's also gonna be horrible days where you sit on the edge of your bed and you cry and you think this is how, this is how it ends, right? Don't give up and then know, and then know your own limits also. Don't give up and know your own limits. Know actually how much work you can get done in a day and don't give up until you either accomplish that or know your limits and then say, I can only devote this much time because um, Everybody needs to sleep. There's a lot of advice there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Everyone needs to sleep. Well, my first one was know your customers. The biggest, you know, value to our business is our relationship with our customers. But Ken took that one. And then don't give up, especially on the hard days, was my second one, which Catherine just took. But when you're talking specifically about people just wanting to start out, I think that's the key right there is start. Go do something. Take some actionable steps. Or to go take a step that leads to an actionable result that's going to get you on that path and keep you moving. Then you can not give up and then you go best your ideas with your customers and kind of pull it all together. Great. Thank you all. And uh, audience watching out there, we might have a, uh, room for one more question. If you have it, please type it in the chat box. Otherwise, uh, well, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and if you have registered for this webinar, you will receive a recorded link along with a short one to two minute survey. So please let us know how we did and what other topics you would like us to cover during our WebNet webinars. Uh, we also would like to invite you back on Thursday, October 15th at noon to participate in our webinar with Hire Heroes USA on getting the job and growing from within and our October 22nd webinar with ARP and government contracting. I just wanna say a huge thank you to our guest speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise to help our small business owners stay afloat during this pandemic. And to all of you watching on behalf of the IBMF, thank you and we hope to see you here again in October for our next webinar. Thank you all, have a good day.